everyone and welcome to this meeting of the Washington County Board of Education. I call this meeting to order and declare a quorum. We have six members present this evening along with our student member, Mr. Gupta. At this time, I'd like us all to stand please. Mrs. Murray will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance followed by a moment of silence. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. This time we'll have approval of this evening's agenda. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Stauffer. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Zentmeyer. Is there any discussion? Okay, seeing none, we'll move to the vote. All those in favor? Okay, we have six affirmative votes. Student member concurs. We'll move to the approval of the minutes. Mrs. Williams, I move for the approval of the closed session minutes dated Tuesday, July 13th, 2021. Thank you, Mr. Gusford. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Zentmeyer. Are there any additions or corrections to the minutes of the closed session of July 13th, 2021? Okay, then we'll move to the vote. We're voting to approve the closed session minutes of July 13th, 2021. All those in favor? We have six votes. Motion carries. Those minutes are approved. Mrs. Williams, I move for the second uh, approval of the business meeting minutes dated Tuesday, July 13th, 2021. Thank you. Is there a second? second? Thank you, Dr. Zentmeyer. Are there any additions or corrections to the minutes of the business meeting of July 13th, 2021? Then we'll move to the vote. All those in favor of approval. All right, we have six affirmative votes and the student member concurs. Those minutes stand approved. Okay, I have a, an announcement. I have a statement to read with regard to the Open Meetings Compliance Board opinion that was recently received. The Washington County Board of Education recently received an opinion from the Open Meetings Compliance Board dated July 29, 2021. The Compliance Board found a violation of the Open Meetings Act occurred on May 25, 2021. On this date, the Washington County Board of Education convened an in-person public hearing to receive comments on the proposed closure of two schools. Access to the hearing room had to be restricted in order to comply with the governor's then existed, then existing, excuse me, COVID-19 executive order and public health officials guidance. However, an alternative means of observing the proceedings was not provided. A copy of the Compliance Board's opinion is being circulated for board members to sign in accordance with Section 3-211B-2 of the Open Meetings Act. On behalf of the Washington County Board of Education, I would like to ensure our community that this body is committed to making our public meetings and public information relating to our school system accessible and transparent. Thank you. This is the portion of the meeting that we have public comment. We do have two individuals who have signed up in advance to speak. The first person I have is Mr. Chad Walker. Mr. Walker, would you come forward? Mr. Walker, Mr. Gessford is serving as our timer this evening. 
Speakers have five minutes to speak. Mr. Gessford will show you a yellow warning sign when your five minutes is um, getting close to being over and the red stop sign when your time has expired. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I'm here to present an issue that has arised due to the National Pike Festival using uh, the practice soccer field in, Plum, in front of Plum Grove this year. Uh, I am asking a, a revision on the policy for the um, policy for no activities after 9 p.m. The reason that I feel that I needed to come and speak on behalf of the school board is in previous years, we have always used the soccer practice field in front of Plum Grove until 9 p.m. It is closed at 9 p.m. for spectators. However, participants stay the night, including board members myself. I am here to present on behalf of that um, and state that in previous years, we've never had an issue. This is the first year that has arised that we were uh, aware that we had to carry our own insurance policy as well as no activities after 9 p.m. I did send an email to uh, Mr. Boyd and some of the other board members stated that, stated that um, we were unaware of these policies as well as the return email stated that the central board had never been aware that our activity went beyond 9 p.m. on Friday night there at the soccer field. However, upon getting the two principals to sign, it comes behalf the maybe not the school board, but it comes be behalf of the facility services director to sign for final approval before it is sent to us. We have followed the same timelines year after year, the same form year after year. This year was the first year that we had issues. We believe that we need to continue to use this practice field on behalf of the Historical Society as well because our organization ties into Plum Grove Mansion. We feel that if we relocate the starting point of the National Pike Festival to the Carnival Grounds or the Clear Spring Park, it will deter people from supporting the Historical Society at Plum Grove as well as deter people from supporting our organization, being that they have to go to two separate locations. We believe that our event is very edu educational to keep going, and we would like to keep it going starting at the soccer fields at, in front of, there in front of Plum Grove. I'm not sure whether the board is aware, but I would like the community to be aware that our organization does give away a $500 scholarship to a Washington County public school student who is furthering their education in biochemistry, chemistry, agriculture, anything geared towards agriculture related. Therefore, we feel that it is unfair for us to not be able to use the school board or the school grounds there in front of Plum Grove we feel as if we might be taken advantage of as if we're giving away the $500 scholarship as if you guys aren't participating with us. So I wanted to bring that be, you know, um, forward to the board so you're aware because not many people are aware that we do give away that scholarship. And we ask that Maybe Mr. Jeff Prow meet with me or the president moving forward so we can follow the procedures and protocols as we should be and asking for a revision for the policy of no overnight encampment at the soccer fields at Plum Grove after 9 p.m. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Thank you. Mr. Vasilius Tzimoranis, did I butcher that too much? Would you pronounce it for me, please? Tiamoranis, would you come forward, please? 
Oh, you don't have anything to comment? I have you down as as public comment. Yeah, no, I have not. Okay. Thank thank you very much. Okay, this would be the time for board member response to public comment if there is any. Business, we have no old business, and that brings us to new business. Our first item of consideration under new business is this evening's consent agenda. We have our supervisor of purchasing, Mr. Scott Bakel, here. Good evening, Mr. Bakel. Good evening, President Williams, <coughs> members, of the, members of the board, Dr. Michael. Tonight, I have two items for your review. The purchasing review committee has reviewed these items, and they are being recommended for approval and staff is available if you have any additional questions. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Is there a motion? President Williams, I move to approve the procurements and renewals for auto parts and delivery to Napa Auto Parts at the discounts listed and Adobe Suite licenses uh, renewal to Bell Tech Logics at a cost of $55,534.50. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Zentmeyer. Any discussion or any questions for Mr. Bakedel? No? Then we'll move to the vote. We're moving to approve the procurements and renewals for auto parts and delivery to Napa Auto Parts at the discounts listed in Exhibit 1 and to Adobe Suite licenses, the renewal to Bell Tech Logics at a cost of $55,534.50. All those in favor of approval? Right, we have six votes. Student member concurs. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Bancel. Our second item under new business this evening is a contract for the replacement of the roof at Western Heights Middle School with Jeff Prue, our Chief Operating Officer, and Mr. Robert Rollins, Director of Facilities Planning and Development. Good evening. Good evening, Mrs. Williams, members of the board, Dr. Michael. Uh, this evening, uh, staff is presenting to you uh, a request to rescind the contract for the replacement roof at Western Heights Middle School. Uh, the, the details of uh, the request are listed here for you. In short, uh, the board awarded a contract to the company D Project Incorporated on April 6, 2021, in the amount of $1.3 million, actually $1,330,000. Uh, staff executed the contract with D Project on April 15, 2021. Uh, over the course of the last number of months, the contractors advised the board or, or staff that uh, there were issues with the supply chain. We've tried to work with uh, the contractor on numerous occasions to uh, spread the timeline of the project completion uh, as of late. Uh, the contractor has made staff aware that he is running into significant overruns which, of which he would like to pass on to the Board of Education. Staff feels it's in the, in the board's best interest and that of the taxpayers that if we are going to pay overruns based on supply chain issues that are current in the market based on, on issues relating to the pandemic, uh, that we take an opportunity to rescind the contract at this time and to rebid at a later time and compete those cost overruns to ensure uh, the best value for the, for the taxpayers. Uh, at that time, we uh, you know, would recommend to the contractor that he also rebid. Uh, there's no issues with the contractor. Thank you, and, Mr. And Mr. Rollins is here as well if you have any questions. Okay. Is there a motion? President Williams, I move to rescind the contract approval of April 6, 2021 to D Project Inc. for the replacement of the roof at Western Heights Middle School in the amount of $1,330,000 except to allow staff to determine the appropriate compensation to the vendor for costs already <coughs> incurred. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Zentmeyer. Are there any questions for Mr. Prue or Mr. Rollins? Any discussion? No? All right, then we'll vote on Mr. Evans' motion. All those in favor of the motion? All right, we have six affirmative votes. Student member concurs, motion carries. Thank, Thank you. you, gentlemen. No 
move now to the superintendent's report. Dr. Michael. Okay, thank you, uh, President Williams. At this time, I'd like to ask Dr. Willow and Mr. Jeff Crew to come forward. I'm uh, going to share a little insight into the Washington County Acceleration uh, Accelerated Learning Plan for the upcoming year. I know a lot of people are anxious about our uh, new year coming up that starts for students on August 30th. Uh, we're obviously continuing to plan with safety in mind uh, with COVID so active here in our area. But we're also very, very excited to uh, help students return to normal. And our plan is to accelerate learning at this point. So our goal is at this point next year, you'll never even know COVID existed you'll, from the academic success of our students as well as the safety of our students and staff. So at this point, I'll turn it over to staff. I think Mr. Pruse is going to begin. Thank you, Dr. Michael. Uh, I think we've got a presentation we'll load here for you. Uh, ultimately, I think what Dr. Willow and I are going to walk you through today uh, is some of the guiding principles behind the plan here to return. Kind of give a moment here to get the presentation up. Can we have that flipped to face us? Or? Thank you, Dr. Willow. So we're looking to protect the health and safety, of course, for all stakeholders, provide access to grade level instruction for all students, promote social and emotional wellness for students and staff, ensure equity, collaborate and communicate with family and community partners, and embrace the need to be flexible, agile, and evolving. Uh, to maintain healthy environments in the classroom, a lot of our uh, physical distancing protocols will carry over from the previous year, although we are expecting to be uh, definitely at 100% capacity with the exception of students uh, that are moving on to the ABLE program. So, uh, you know, we're not going to be at six foot social distancing, but we're going to maximize space wherever that space is available. We'll continue to provide hand sanitizer for all classrooms as well as public spaces, maintaining the air purifiers in the, purifiers in the classrooms uh, that we purchased during the course of the last school year, continue to disinfect regularly uh, throughout the day and also on the second shift when the building is empty, encourage frequent hand washing for students and staff and limiting uh, the use of shared equipment. From a transportation perspective, again, safety is always at the top of the top of mind for our transportation staff, uh, continuing with bus inspections and enhanced protocols, as well as additional driver training on disinfecting buses between runs uh, and at the end of the AM shift and of course at the end of the PM shift as well. For seating, families should expect that buses will be at full normal capacity. Uh, and that is, that is a change from last year. I think as we got to the end of last year, uh, we started seeing uh, bus ridership increasing to 30, 35, 40 on some buses. But it should not be a surprise if we are uh, back to two, two persons to a seat on most of our bus routes. Passengers must wear a bus, uh, must wear a mask or a face covering while they're on a school bus per the CDC. And that is, uh, that is part of a federal directive order. And that is no different than the, the masking order that is uh, in place right now if you're traveling on an airplane or you're traveling, let's say, in, uh, in Hagerstown on the county commuter. It's the same rule that applies to those locations, also applies to school buses. Why don't we repeat that? Since that's a change from summer school, uh, we found out about this after we announced our protocols for the summer school as far as students wearing masks. We felt like during the summer we ran with all of our buses with the windows completely down. Uh, but as we get into cooler weather, I mean, right away we're going to start closing windows up and things like that. And uh, after further reviewing, this is CDC, not guidance. This is CDC requirement. So much like you would not get on a plane and fly anywhere, you would be escorted off the plane if you refuse to wear a mask. We're in the same boat, the same law. We're required to wear a mask. So our drivers, our attendants, and students are required to wear a mask. Um, hopefully, we won't be masked in school. So we'll provide masks if students forget masks. Students are welcome to bring their own uh, face covering. But we'll provide masks throughout the year as long as this uh, regulation is in effect. Uh, so students can quickly pick up a mask, wear their mask, discarded in the trash can when they leave the bus and get a new one when they get back on at the end of the day. And I think as point of clarification, I think you mentioned it, but again, also not to, to gloss over that. At this point, uh, we're leaving it to individual's choice um, at masking um, in the classroom and in the building. I mean, so the bus is mandatory, but the classroom is uh, family's choice at this point, um, at, at this time. And we're watching metrics and, and hoping, honestly, not to go back to that point uh, and just stay where we are. 
looking forward to, uh, into our meal service programs. Uh, again, going to be a little bit back to normal. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, you know, a month or so ago when we, we presented the food and nutrition services budget, again, we've got universal free meals for all students. Uh, the, the rules have, have changed slightly from last year to this year, so we are having to restore to what's known as the offer versus serve system. So um, we've been operating under a system where uh, we would provide fruits and vegetables as the side item to the meals, uh, kind of similar to what we do normally in our summer programs. We now have to revert to the normal national school lunch program uh, regulations, which means only the student can choose which items they want to take or not take. So that, that's the offer versus serve system. Uh, so we'll be displaying items for students to select as opposed to prepackaging meals for them as we did last year. Uh, <coughs> we'll be using uh, badge readers to, uh, to capture student ID numbers. So it's a, it's a barcode scan uh, from student IDs. We can also print those from both the Synergy system as well as the uh, the point of sale service system for the school cafeterias uh, to make them available for our for our younger learners but we'll be looking to utilize also the bar scans that come on the student ID badges in middle and high schools uh, and I think there'll be other places within the building that will also be using uh, those, those scanners I think also in the library we'll be using the, the barcodes uh, to identify students with uh, with books and so forth and we'll be focusing on prepaid accounts uh, for purchases of a la, a la, other a la carte items again uh, having money on account in advance speeds the line, uh, so we're looking to our families to uh, use less cash during the lunch line service. We may take prepayments maybe at the beginning of the day uh, as students are arriving as opposed to taking them on the lunch line so that we can keep, keep the line moving at lunch and keep the backup down and, keep, uh, and, and limit crowding a little bit in that area. Mr. Proof, for all students for this year, the traditional lunch breakfast is free? That's correct. For all of this school year, the traditional breakfast and lunch is free for all students. So much of this past year, uh, regardless whether you qualify for free or reduced meals, all students will be eligible for free breakfast, free uh, lunch for the Correct. second year. What Mr. Prue was referring to when he was talking about adding money to your account would be for a la carte items, which would not be part of the free and reduced meal program. Correct. And we can't underscore uh, the importance at this point enough that a free and reduced meal application is still available for this year because the eligibility <coughs> status identified from that application process is worthwhile to the school system and also to the students for many more programs outside of just the school meals. So for high school students, for instance, you can receive testing waivers, cost waivers, if you're eligible for free and reduced price meals. There are other community programs that leverage that, uh, that number and as well as uh, portions of the school system's overall budget from the state are dependent on that free and reduced data. So we can't can't emphasize enough for our families to continue to file that free and reduced meal application regardless of the meal program status. And, <clears throat> excuse me, the status you received this year, assuming we go back to normal in FY23 in September of 22 with a normal free reduced paid meal service, your, your meal balance status from this year will carry over into the following year. So it is still important to complete that meal application. Uh, it, Maintaining other healthy environments, other things, you know, the school system is going to continue to do contact tracing uh, with isolation and quarantine in collaboration with uh, state and local health departments and the protocols that are there. Uh, that, that has not gone away. We still need to monitor that. We will still maintain a COVID response team uh, to, to address concerns as they arise. We are planning to continue with the Maryland Department of Health Diagnostic Testing Program which is a, a rapid test that can be done right in the health room, and Meredith is assisting us with that program. Uh, and again, uh, per uh, some of the requirements under, under ESSER 3 and the American Recovery Plan, uh, we'll be using efforts to provide vaccinations uh, within our school community, uh, doing predominantly outreach. Uh, There's probably a good opportunity that the health, for me to announce as well. I know I, I think our, our communications office has sent notifications, but the health department is offering a vaccination clinic in the community this week on Friday. I know currently enrollments are low in that, so if folks are interested in, in the vaccines, there is an opportunity uh, this week in the, in the community with the health department as among other locations as well. So last month I talked with you about the concept of acceleration, and it's important that we review that again. We know that students have unfinished learning from the pandemic. We know that we are having students start grade level uh, classes where they may not have had the prerequisites that they need in order to be successful. This summer, we've had a number of teachers, administrators coming in and participating in curriculum enhancements. So how do we provide grade level access to all of our students? Well, we do that in a number of ways. 
One is through clarity. What are those priority learning goals that every student has to master? And how do we create that progression that allows for a teacher to be able to teach in the amount of time needed to be able to teach to the grade level standards? The scaffolds are what allow us to ensure that all students can access grade level material. To Dr. Michael's point, remediation, we never catch up in a remediation cycle. When we remediate, we're always going back and reteaching, and we take away time from the grade level uh, standards of today. And what ends up happening is that eighth grader goes on to, from seventh grade, and we go back and we teach seventh grade. Uh, but then we miss out on eighth grade standards, so the student moves on to ninth grade, and what do we have to do again? We have to keep going back and remediating. What we talk about with acceleration, what prerequisites, what does the student need in order to access today's learning? And how do we help our teachers by building that in right into our curriculum? We can't do that work on our own. So we had a number of teachers sit with us this summer to help figure out that problem. Uh, and that's what I think we're most excited about to start this year. With the additional support that the board has made with purchases for primary resources and secondary resources, the scaffolding that's built into our curriculum, uh, the clarity, the prioritization of the learning goals, and then we've also built in a number of opportunities to provide feedback because we know that feedback is essential in student learning. And as I look, everyone uh, here knows the value of relationships. Um, and so that is still an essential uh, component of our acceleration model. And you'll continue to hear this idea or this concept of acceleration throughout the year as I come and continue to provide updates to you. So what academic supports do we have in addition uh, to what we talked about with acceleration for everyone. We'll continue with diagnostic and local assessments. We need to continue to identify students who have unfinished learning. We have some local assessment data from last spring, but in the first marking period, we'll have the opportunity to get from students that participated in summer school, students that didn't participate in summer school, all students will have the opportunity to take some local assessments and the state assessment for MCAP. And from that data, we'll be able to also see who has unfinished learning. We're offering tutoring supports before, during, and after school. We've hired additional tutors using our ESSER funds. We now have 40 tutors uh, full-time that help students throughout the day. And again, that is funded through our ESSER funds. We'll continue with our Tier 2 and Tier Literacy uh, math interventions. These are for students that need additional help additional support beyond the general classroom setting. I think at the July meeting, I talked with you a little bit about our summer school program, where this year we expanded summer school opportunities, where students had the option to earn up to four repeat credits or two original credits. For students that were unable to participate in summer school or maybe have additional work that's required, we're looking at twilight programming at our schools that have the number of students that need it. And we'll also have evening high school, which is uh, our traditional setting for where high school students have the ability to take additional courses uh, to either get ahead or to catch up. We go to the uh, next slide. We talk a little bit about the idea of health and wellness of students and staff. I think it's important to remind uh, our community, to remind the board that Every student had a different path uh, from March of 2020. And so what we're talking about are that we'll have second graders entering our buildings that haven't been in school potentially since kindergarten. We'll have seventh graders at the middle school level that may never have, been, uh, have attended a middle school. And we'll have 10th graders at high school that may not have had any ninth grade experience in person. And so what we know is that for all of our students, there's going to be different challenges. So we've braided our funds, we've used Title IV funds, we've used ESSER funds to provide additional counselors and social workers inside our buildings. In addition, we've used Title IV funding, which we presented last year, to provide to be able to provide outside counseling services for our students that need it. Uh, and that's the access to the outside mental health providers. And we know that when we are working with students that have experienced uh, different situations during the past year and a half that our staff need additional training to be able to meet the needs of students. And so we've provided that. We continue to provide that. We have an excellent opportunity coming up where we have staff members, the ability to come back and participate at the summit, 
which is a week before the traditional uh, summer, before the traditional school year would begin for staff. And we have opportunities after school, and we'll also have opportunities during supervisor-led uh, day. We want to help our staff be able to meet the needs of our students. And the best part about some of our professional learning is it's not CES based. We work with our teachers to see what's working in the classroom. We work to see what's working in our buildings. And we have them help participate in that professional learning and lead that professional learning. Talk a little bit about extracurricular activities. Um, right now, our plan is that extracurricular activities will follow a normal state schedule. Um, but we have some precautions in place to make sure that, again, we take the safety of our students, our athletes, our coaches, our spectators, and we, we keep that in mind as we're planning our fall seasons. We will have personal protective equipment available for any student that wants it, for any coach or any staff member that wants it. It is not required that our athletes wear masks, but they will have the option, and we would encourage them to do so if they uh, want to take advantage of that. And we'll go a step further and provide that if necessary. We'll have hand, stand, hand sanitizing stations available. Um, we'll continue to no sharing of personal property. That's been something that we've had in place. Everybody brings their own water bottle. Everybody brings their own gear. Uh, so the idea is, is that we're not sharing things. And we'll continue to encourage physical distancing as much as possible. Um, but obviously, in the competition of games and when we get into certain practice situations, that won't always be possible. So when do our competition seasons begin? Uh, fall sports start Wednesday, August 11th. And then our first play date would be Friday, September 3rd. And for now, uh, that would, we are on track to hit that date and, and run. Um, our extra, our co-curricular activities, such as band, uh, such as chorus, orchestra, theater programs, are all up and running as well. Um, and, you know, and again, it is up to each school to, to determine those dates of when band camp is and some of the other things that would be traditional as part of any summer. Questions? Okay. Uh, we've got to entertain the questions the board might have right now. Um, maybe one clarification. I think in sports, right now, assuming nothing changes in Washington County, as we play counties, other counties, particularly in Maryland, I think there's a, uh, an agreement that each county would have to minimally abide by the rules of the other county of the home team. Is that correct? That is correct. So when our athletes right now, for example, Frederick County would be our uh, would be an example to what Dr. Michael's referring to. When our athletes attend Frederick County, they would have to follow all of the rules set for Frederick County. So if masking was required for Frederick County, that would be the expectation of not only our student athletes, but our coaches, and I believe spectators as well. So it's just important that we keep up with all those things. I anticipate we're gonna continuously have changes over the next couple weeks. Hopefully things will improve and counties will drop some of their requirements. Hopefully we won't see things uh, increase with COVID and we would have to make changes ourselves. So we'll just have to wait and see what happens. But those are things we know as of right now. Uh, we're firm on our plan for right now. But again, as uh, Mr. Prue mentioned, we obviously have to continue to follow the metrics. Uh, I really believe our hand washing and our distancing worked well last year for the common cold, traditional flu, as well as COVID. Uh, so I want to see those practices continue the very best we can. But we also want to return to normal uh, in every way that's possible. I think Mr. Stafford, you had a question. I'm sorry. I just uh, <clears throat> want to know more about Twilight High School. I know what Evening High School is, but how, are the, how do the students get into the Twilight School? This is at each individual school. Are there regular staff members there who are then compensated extra? For staying and so forth. You want to yeah. So Twilight last that? year, uh, the, the two bigger high schools that have Twilight programs would be North Hagerstown High School and South Hagerstown High School. Uh, the positions are posted and typically what happens is they start right at the end of the school day. So where you have that traditional gap sometimes between when the school day ends and evening high begins, Twilight starts right at the end of the day. Right. Usually it is a staff member within the building. Um, and again, it's based on the needs of the building. So if I have a population of students that need English, I'm going to run that English course. If I have a population of students that need algebra, I'm going to run that algebra course. Uh, sometimes our schools will partner up. Um, if there's another school that's close by and, and uh, students do not have the option to take a Twilight course 
at their school. We allow for students to be able to take them, uh, again, on a case-by-case -case basis at other schools as well. It's just another option for students to be able to take courses that they need. Well, if it starts right after school, do we transport students who don't have the opportunity at their school? But It depends. So some of our seniors may leave early. As an example, Mr. Stafford to go take an HCC class and then come back or go to work and then come back. You know, some of our evening high upperclassmen aren't in uh, school full day. They, they might come for three periods in a day and then come back for evening high or twilight because that's the last class they need in order to graduate. So it's really, again, based on each individual student's plan and what they need in order to graduate and what best meets their needs. Mr. Gasford? Uh, just a, maybe two questions, but um, do we have a, a safety plan for our special needs students? Is, does it vary? from what our regular plan is, or is there a special plan for, you know, for like a Marshall Street, what does that kind of look like for safety plan? So that's actually required as part of the IEP process. There is a safety plan for each student, and again, uh, it's based on the individual uh, uniqueness of each student and what their needs are. Um, and so we review that as part of the annual IEP meeting. Because there, I mean, I think that's probably a little bit different than just a regular student coming in. So do we take extra precautions? So from Marshall Street, uh, I, I think that, and I'll, I'll let Mr. Uh, Prue jump in if there's anything additional that we're doing with Marshall Street itself, but with each student having a unique IEP and, and part of that plan, I think that, again, based on those needs of that student, um, it, the plan can look really different from one student to another student. Okay. And, and I think I might add, you know, from a, a safety perspective, you know, Marshall Street School, off the top of my head, uh, Marshall Street School is roughly 53,000 53, square feet. It's a sizable building for a population between Marshall Street and Job Development Center that is, you know, give or take 50 students. Uh, so, so the, you know, Sarah Stair, the principal there, has, has been able to spread students out, spread staff out, so that uh, we can do a little bit more social distancing. Because clearly, you know, if we think about last year, when, when masking was required, a lot of the students at that school could not wear masks because uh, right. it's a safety caution for them. Right. Uh, so it was imperative that we really had staff spread apart. And beyond COVID at Marshall Street, we have students that are medically fragile. Some of them have nursing um, requirements and things like that and have a whole host of, um, you know, medical protocols we have to follow. And all that is absolutely implemented mm -hmm. according to the IEP and according to best practices. And we work with parents, absolutely. you know, on that too, to get them through, especially if if we go back into the COVID, you know, the virus time and the accelerated learning issue is going to be a, a, another problem that we're going to have because we're not going to have that. So is that going to, how's that going to affect it? Uh, I mean, we would continue to meet the IEP needs the very best we can. Last year when all students were removed from the school setting, it made it difficult to do that. So we tried to do our very best to be in compliance with IEPs and that's what we would do going forward. I'm hoping that we don't see anything like that. Uh, right. and again, we're, our goal is to return to normal as much as possible. Uh, we also don't want Washington County Public Schools, this has been our goal since the very beginning of COVID, not to be a super spreader site in any way. So we're gonna do our part here in the community to make sure that that's not, not the case here. Um, I just had a question. Uh, will students be expected to wipe down desks? Because um, I know that currently, or in the previous year, they were asked to wipe down desks after each period. I think there's, uh, I think it's a good practice in a sense that uh, we're keeping materials, you know, regardless of COVID, uh, keeping materials and surfaces uh, clean for the next. We have changed uh, the product. We've moved away from the disinfectant. We've moved to a peroxide cleaner. A uh, little less caustic uh, and, and much safer for all to use and for regular daily use and, and you know, in some cases, hourly use. So uh, I think we'll see some of that across the board, uh, but, but with a change of product as well. Okay. Mr. Crew, I think there's been some new guidance, too, on the necessity to wipe down everything constantly. Some, some things now are requiring or suggesting that we wipe them down once or twice a day. Right. I mean, I think what we've learned over the last 18 months is the virus is much more airborne than it is from touching contact surfaces. Different from, let's say, normal flu, normal common cold, uh, which is much more common on, on surfaces. So, you know, I, you know, I don't know that we'll have a need to wipe and disinfect throughout the day as much as we did. I think 
uh, which is part of why we changed to the peroxide cleaner away from the disinfectant to, uh, you know, get normal common pathogens off the surface without necessarily worrying about, you know, totally sanitizing the, the surface. Okay. All right. If there are no further questions, thank you very much. Thank uh, you. We'll continue thank to provide the board with updates. Uh, you know, if we have significant changes or anything at the next board meeting in two weeks, we'll, we'll bring back those changes uh, or any updates that we have. Right now, I'm excited about the new school year. Uh, I'm excited to return to normal, whatever our new normal is. I do think we've learned a lot of things, uh, particularly with technology. Uh, a lot of what Dr. Willow just shared uh, with our acceleration model, you may have noticed in the corners of each of those, of that graphic, um, an effect size. An effect size is, you know, use the most effective uh, learning strategies to help accelerate learning, and we have purposely targeted those four strategies as strategies with high effect size that in a normal year would help accelerate learning. So we have many subgroups that have not been successful in the past. Our goal is to help those students be successful, grade level and above grade level students be successful, um, and as quickly as possible. We're kind of in that transition period. Um, the last week of July to the first week of August is the time period that we have summer school graduation this week on Thursday at six o'clock. We will have summer school graduation, normally 25, 30 students. I think this year we're estimated to have over 100 students in summer school graduation. Uh, so that'll be exciting. That'll kind of capstone uh, or kind of finalize the 2020-2021 uh, school year with that event on Thursday. Tomorrow, we kick off our administrative meetings um, where we meet with all of our school-based administrators, our curriculum staff. Uh, so I kind of look at that as the kickoff of the new year, kind of the official, this week we kind of have both, kind of the ending of last year with students and the kickoff with administrators uh, tomorrow. Uh, that's gonna be followed by next Wednesday and Thursday. We kick off with new teacher induction. We have about 130 teachers invited to our new teacher induction. I'm, Wednesday and Thursday of next week, so we're excited about that. Following that week, we have something new um, to help us with professional learning for all staff, for particularly teachers. Uh, but we have four days of what we're calling the Learning Summit or Professional Development Summit. We have over a thousand teachers that have, they will be paid, but they're voluntarily giving up part of their summer to come and participate in selected professional development opportunities. So we're very excited about uh, the outcomes of that professional development opportunity, a lot of choice and selection for our teachers to make. Uh, August 23rd will be the date that all staff will be back, and we're back up and running full with staff, and then obviously August 30th is our first day for students. I think that was four weeks from yesterday. So summer's slowly starting to wind down for staff and students. Uh, we're excited about that. In the last couple days, I've seen band camps and uh, students in, um, weightlifting, conditioning, those types of things. As Dr. Willow mentioned, August 11th, we kick off fall sports uh, with practices, so we're excited to see that happening. Um, next couple, couple weeks, people will be receiving their student schedules, class rosters, assignments, those types of things. So a lot more to come about the new year, but it's quickly approaching, and we are very excited about uh, returning to normal and having an outstanding year as we accelerate learning for all of our students. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Michael. The next item on our agenda is personnel action. We have Dr. Willow presenting this evening. Good evening again. This is Williams, Dr. Michael, and board members. As discussed earlier in closed session, there are several staff changes for your review. At this time, I will ask for your approval of today's personnel actions. Thank you, Dr. Willow. Is there a motion? President Williams, I move to approve the staff changes that were discussed earlier in closed session. Thank you, Mrs. Murray. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Zentmeyer. Any questions for Dr. Willow? Okay, then we'll move to the vote. We're voting to approve personnel actions <coughs> as discussed earlier this afternoon in closed session. All those in favor? Unanimously approved. Uh, Mrs. Williams, if I might, I'd like to point out the generally announced principals. There are a number of other staff changes on here that were approved tonight, assistant principals, some other administrative um, roles. But I do want to note tonight 
that Ms. Tamson Wilson will be the new principal at Bester Elementary School, moving from Smithburg Elementary School as principal to Bester Elementary School. Uh, so we're excited um, for Tamson and we wish her the best there. Uh, replacing Tamson or Ms. Wilson at Smithburg Elementary will be a gentleman named Gary Rand. Very excited to have Gary join our team. He comes from Montgomery County. He's currently a principal there in an elementary school, uh, has outstanding uh, background, and is going to be a great addition to Washington County Public Schools. So just wanted to make those two notes. I know people are always interested in who the principal will be. There's obviously some other changes on staff changes tonight as well. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll have report to the board. We'll have uh, board committee reports. Dr. Zentmeyer, would you like to begin? Our next meeting is Monday, August 16th here at 3 p.m. And that's the Curriculum and Instruction Committee. Thank you. <laughs> you didn't say that, but that's what it is. Oh, Thank you. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Dr. Zentmeyer's committee. Thank you. Mr. Evans. Yeah, the uh, Finance Committee will be meeting. Uh, I think Mr. Pruitt could double check. I believe it's Friday, August 27th our next meeting early in the morning right yeah 8 a. oh yeah 8 a.m thank you <laughs> thank you mr gasford facilities will be meeting in august uh date to, and time to be determined thank you <coughs> i'm going to be reporting for uh mr bickford who is chair of the policy review and development committee there was to be a policy committee meeting on August 10th at 1.30. That meeting has been canceled and will be rescheduled. So the uh, date and time will be announced and posted on board docs. Human resources will be meeting again in September and next meeting I'll have the exact date and time. Thank you. Mr. Sir, do you have anything from student government to report? I have nothing to report. Okay. Committee reports under miscellaneous business. We have one item, and that's future agenda items. We have coming up, coming up in October. In addition to the agenda list is the report on the 2021 summer schools. And if you have a suggestion for an agenda item, please let a member of the agenda planning committee know so that we can take care of your request. That brings us to board member comments. Dr. Zetmeyer, would you like to begin down there? I would. I would. Both sides of my family are farmers and teachers. So it's kind of in my blood to look for a lesson wherever I go. And this morning, consider uh, the tomato patch. As I was picking tomatoes in that cool effulgence of the morning reminding you to get that giddy back to school feeling in the pit of your stomach, I thought about how many seeds are in a tomato. If I split this open, there'd be over 100, maybe 200 seeds. And so, I only sowed seven, and I have enough to can and keep all of my neighbors in tomatoes. Anybody want to do <laughs> <laughs> um, But I wanted to know, if we consider what kind of seeds we're gonna sow this year. Are we gonna sow seeds of love or fear? Hope or despair? Peace or protest? Curiosity, creativity, achievement, opportunity, or the lack thereof? I'm confident that Washington County Public Schools is committed to sowing all seeds of success to every single student. Life is a garden, and we need to carefully consider what seeds we're sowing in it. If you want to reap a rich harvest, you got to sow some good seeds. And I thank all of you for being on my farm team. Thank you, Dr. Sandmeyer. Mr. Evans. I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mr. Evans. Mr. Gasper. I would just like to say that you know, June and July has flown by, and it just seems like it was yesterday we were saying everyone have a great summer. But it's, it's time to be thinking about getting our kids back to school again. 
and that's that's exciting and um, I look forward to hopefully a very productive year um, maybe hopefully not as challenging as it has been in the past year and a half um, because I think we're due for a nice settling down and have a good uh, calm school year so I'm looking for some good uh, sports out there I'm looking for some good uh, end of year results and students being um, very well educated and um, so um, very productive I hope we are and I think we uh, have our team in place and I know that um, staff is now turned away from summer school and now moving into the administration part and I'd like to welcome all the new teachers that will be coming along. I think um, that's always exciting to see those uh, new teachers uh, come aboard and all staff who's new. So um, welcome aboard and uh, let's have a very successful school, beginning of a school year for all administrators out there and, and our staff who are starting to come back into the classrooms. Thank you, Mr. Ginsburg. Mr. Stauffer? Uh, three things. One, I hope we have a successful school year without a lot of bumps in the road. Uh, personally, I can't stand another year like we just had. Uh, secondly, I want to commend Dr. Michael because uh, he spoke to the Williamsport Lions Club last Tuesday night, of which I am a member, and uh, he enlightened some of the members about some of the things that WCPS did uh, in handling the COVID crisis and so forth. A lot of members were surprised that, that the board made thousands of face shields for Meredith's Medical Center uh, because of the 3D printers at uh, Tech High School. And on a third note, hope you didn't save any tomatoes for me because I hate tomatoes. So. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Stauffer. Mrs. Murray. Williams, I have two things actually. I was honored to represent the board Sunday at the Discovery Station's 25th uh, year anniversary. Um, Dr. Michael and his lovely wife Denise were there also, and uh, it was very nice. Um, the second thing is I just completed the summer reading challenge um, at the Washington County Free Library, and here is my shirt. <laughs> It says Tails, T-A-I-L-S, and Tails, T-A-L-E-S. My daughter, my two grandsons, and I all participated. It was very easy. You only had to read 600 minutes. You got some really cool gifts. I got a drink bottle. I got a super straw. I got a bookmark, and I got this neat lunch bag. Um, and it's still, you can still sign up and do it. So. You can take your kids down to the library, go see Mr. Jeff, he'll sign you up, and um, adults can read, you can read to your kids, and it's a wonderful program, and I recommend it to everybody. So visit your library and start reading. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Murray. Mr. Gupta? Uh, Mrs. Williams, uh, I just want to say I look forward to having a school year where students are in school. I know last year uh, a couple of students did come back to school. Um, and I'm sure a lot of them, actually I heard from a lot of them, and they did enjoy it. So I look forward to having a, a great school year uh, where students are in school and they can talk with their classmates and teachers and develop the bonds that were missing over, these last, over this last school year. Thank you, Mr. Gupta. I have no final words this evening. Mr. Stauffer, that should please you, since you, you're always <laughs> accusing me of having the final word. What are you telling me that for? <laughs> Dr. Michael, is there anything that you have to say in closing? Uh, no, just thank you to all our custodial staff, uh, our maintenance team, and people that are working extremely hard to prepare schools, our administrative team, uh, staff that work summer school and are continuing to work summer school. Um, just a lot of things are happening this summer uh, to get ready for the new school year and to continue to help students. So. I did want to make sure we thank all of those folks. We'll have a summer project uh, update, I'm sure, in September. A lot of really neat things are happening out in our buildings. Uh, I hope to start posting some of those things as they start to wrap up, but I'm really excited about some of the summer projects that are getting completed. Good. Okay, if there's nothing further, then we stand adjourned. Thank you all.